So, good afternoon, everybody. Now we can relax. No more authorities are with us. We hope to ask for less heat for tomorrow, but we cannot promise. Some two announcements before I leave, and I promise not to speak till tomorrow. Uh, as you've arrived to your seat, you have found a sheet of paper. That sheet of paper is so you can choose which is the tour you want to do in Loyola on Wednesday. We need to organize the tours, so those that want to do a tour, please mark it. When are you going to uh, handle it in? After this session, we're going, to have break, uh, we're going to have a break and we're going to have coffee. When we go out from the Paraninfo in the Cloître, we will have the coffee time and there will be 10 desks making difference for our surnames. Uh, the first letter of our surname and each one will go to the desk where we will give, they will give us which is the tax force groups that we are going to be in and which is the room we have to go there. And once you get that paper, you will handle in the tour paper. Okay? And just a question. Has anybody lost his mobile phone? We found a mobile phone. It's blocked and we can't mark to know who it is. If somebody has lost it, I, we have it. Okay? So now, Father, Har Father Garanzini, okay. everything's for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. Alvaro, good job this morning. Um, I'm going to ask you if you will take out the plan, the charter and strategic plan. If you do not have one in your folder, please let me know. I have Spanish versions. Have someone come on up. Just stay where you are and they'll come around with these and get them to you. Spanish version and an English version. Great. Okay, in the back. As you can see, I'm gonna, I wanna walk through this just a little bit so you know what uh, this is about. As you could see, the first part of this handout, this um, flyer, is the charter for the association. You can see for yourself the main purposes uh, that have been spelled out here. This was developed by the International Committee for Jesuit Higher Education that reports at the moment to Father General. We will be replacing that committee with your elected representatives, two from each region. So there'll be a board of 12 that will replace the International Committee and that will report to Father General on issues of higher education. And Father General will be asking this commission 
what it is, this advisory council, what it is that you feel is important as well. You can see that representation in this international association um, depends on being a tertiary degree granting institution. We have a vast variety here, a real variety of institutions, and education, higher education, is structured differently around the world. Uh, many uh, institutions, for example, are private, self-sustaining with their own boards or directors, the society directly appointing the head of that institution, or the board appointing that in the head of that institution. We have institutions that are quite small and are a single faculty. We have institutions that are very complex. To be a member of this association, you must be a member of the regional association. So we have already had requests to join the International Association of Jesuit Universities, and they're not from, from schools, institutions that are not Jesuit institutions per se. They like to think of themselves as Jesuit or they were formerly Jesuit sponsored, but unless they're sponsored by a province and within a region, then they can't belong to this association. So the International Association is actually a network or an association of associations. So each region has an association. Some are older and stronger, more complex than others, more developed. Some are quite new. Some are just getting formed, um, and we'll probably learn about that. We'll learn about that probably on Thursday. So those are two types of members, those that can't be official members because they're not degree-granting institutions sponsored by the society, but they are sponsored by the society, but they may be a research institute or whatever, dealing with people at the postgraduate level, uh, doing research and social uh, advocacy. Those could be associate members, so there's an associate member category. Then how this assembly will work. We will meet every three years. It was decided in Melbourne that um, five years is too long, um, too many changes in institutional leadership, et cetera, too much loss of memory, um, that we would meet every three years. This board, the IAJU Advisory Council, will meet three times each year, two times virtually and once in person in Rome. So they will meet, when they meet in Rome, they will meet with the general. So that's, that's how the organization will function. And it will take its cues from the regional association groups. Then we have, we decided, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, whenever, uh, earlier today, it seems like yesterday, uh, what we decided we would be doing is that we would offer a strategic plan for your consideration, and we would request that you help us complete that plan. So the plan begins with a, with a vision statement, as you can see, to become institutions that promote peace and reconciliation, justice and faith through research and the formation of students in order to transform society and culture. Should that be richer? Should that be more? Should there be some reference to God in Christ? We, those, are, those are issues that we left open. The new board will decide if that's the right vision statement with the advice that you give it. So and I'll explain how that'll work. We selected four core values, collaboration, depth, which is the way that uh, our previous Father General, no, Nicholas, the way he ta used to talk about uh, academic excellence. It means today, everyone says they're academically excellent, no matter what kind of an institution they are, but it means for us today depth. Um, it's a, it's a, a fight against the superficiality that we see in so many ways around us. The issue of discernment, which is very much uh, a Jesuit value and very much spoken about in the recent congregation. And then the preferential option for the poor. So we, set, we selected those four. Should there be 
other values. We have goals to create a vibrant regional association in those places where there is no regional association or where the regional association is not well formed. To implement the calls of GC 35 and 36 to better serve the mission of the church by advancing Catholic social thought. Should that be expanded, for example, to talk a bit about um, Talk a bit about uh, the theological enterprise, the faith enterprise. Uh, Catholic social thought is part of the treasury of the church. It's not the whole treasury of the church. And then foster collaboration and research, not only among ourselves, but also with our other apostolates. So relating to, our, to the other things that, we, um, that the Jesuits sponsor. Then our strategies. So we have five strategies we will talk about uh, this international association is the first strategy, a platform for communication, which I will introduce to you on Thursday. You already began to use a piece of it, which is being changed. When you registered, you, you registered through uh, a group called Ignite, uh, Ignited, and that is a group of, that the business schools, the Jesuit business schools started. We're transitioning to our own platform, so you'll be dealing directly with us. Those of you that had trouble registering see why we need our direct platform. Uh, but it's, it's been housed at Lemoyne, and Lemoyne, in fact, is continuing to serve as the backup for this new uh, e-platform for us. So it's a huge gift from uh, Lemoyne, and Linda Lemur is here. Thank you, Linda, uh, for that. Um, we want to also uh, collaborate, as I said, with the other apostolates, and we want to think about what are the practical programs that this association ought to be thinking about. Uh, I know someone's going to say, how is it going to be financed? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, um, we talked about this as an uh, advisory council. If we charge dues, there's going to be some institutions that immediately cannot participate. So we'd have to have some method for deciding who doesn't need to pay, who pays. Um, that should be agreed on by the board or by the regions. So we didn't want to preempt that decision about how the things would be financed. There's also, uh, if there are projects that we want to do, uh, we'll, we'll have to look for the financing for the project. Is it something that we can seek grant funding for? Is it something that we can use uh, volunteers for? Is it something that an institution wants to take the lead and, and try to do? Those are all, those are all possibilities. Um, but I don't think we should let financing get in the way, although uh, if you know me, you know I know financing is a very important element to getting anything done. Finally, you have the priorities. There are six priorities, and what we decided to do in previous assemblies like this, there was often speakers like we've had and like we will have these first two days, but there were, there were also opportunities for people to talk in smaller groups. That's also very important. And frankly, the groups that were formed and the topics that were chosen were usually all over the place and nothing happened to them. There was no real strategy or plan for what groups would be talking about and what would happen to their, their discussions. So what we decided to do is a representative from each of the six regions worked this past year on a task force and they produced a position paper. These six topics, expanding higher education to those at the margins, forming civic and political leaders, promoting awareness and a sense of urgency for an integrated economic and environmental justice, increasing our effort to better serve and develop the Ignatian character of our own leaders in our school, promoting faith, dialogue, collaboration, um, uh, interfaith dialogue and collaboration, and then promoting the study of peace and reconciliation. Peace and uh, study, it should be study and advocacy, a practice of peace and reconciliation. 
Those topics came out of GC 36 and actually GC 35 as well, the, the decree number one. Those were lifted by the group as the key topics that they thought we should be addressing as higher ed institutions. So the six task forces worked all year. They worked very hard. Uh, they produced a paper. The, paper uh, the papers have been posted and you, you were told they were posted. Each of these task forces is going to explain why they think this is an incredibly important issue that should characterize our institutions going into the future. They will also explain or mention that there are conversations that you will be invited to participate in, and that's what Alvaro was just referring to. Conversation A happens after this session. Conversation B happens tomorrow morning, and conversation C happens tomorrow afternoon. We asked you if you would like to select a conversation topic, uh, and, and we have those, and if you did not, we assigned you to them. What should the conversations do? If you look, if you open your books, your program book to page 59, These, they're not called workshops for a reason. No one's going to lecture you or present you a program. They're called conversations because we'd like, in smaller groups, we'd like to get your reaction, your contribution, your concerns, what you think is involved in this topic, how your institution may be handling it or not handling it. So these conversations are meant to be interactive. Participants should feel free to contribute their knowledge and to ask questions of one another. The role of the facilitator, who is a member of one of their task forces, is to assist the group to follow a uh, for in the flow of conversation and interchange. At the conclusion of the period, the facilitator will report in writing regarding the issues and the consensus of the group. The reports will be taken and studied by the task force chair and a summary of those, hopefully there will be not only comments, um, criticisms about what's not being addressed, uh, suggestions, uh, perhaps volunteering that we are an institution and our in particular institution we would like to take a leadership role and we would love to be part of any kind of group work that happens from here going forward. Those summaries of those reports will be given to the task force chairs who will present them to the board, to this new board that you will elect. So this is a way of trying to begin a process of conversations about particular issues that we want to deal with and follow up. So that at the next of these three years from now, there is a report on what happened on this issue over the last three years. We're trying to build, as you can see, a sense of kind of accountability into this organization. Uh, difficult because it's global, um, people are at different places, but if we could, one of the task force chairs asked me recently, What's your biggest hope? My biggest hope would be that we could build together, we could build communities of concern, professional communities that were speaking with one another, planning with one another, coordinating with one another via the e-platform. So these professional communities are what our ultimate goal would be. And then if projects, specific projects grow up, we would be very happy about that too. On Thursday, let me just talk about, let me talk a bit about Wednesday. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing this over the next two days. On Wednesday, as, as you know, we go to Loyola. The first um, thing that we do will be hear from Father General. He has a prepared text and he will deliver that. We will be in the Basilica. There was an, an aula, I don't know if you had heard this, there was an aula that was being prepared. We were going to be the first ones to use it. There was a roof fire. There was, I think it was the welder 
um, and there was quite a bit of damage, so the aula is not ready for us. We'll, we'll be in the church. So he will deliver that there. Following that, half or three of the regions will begin tours, and you will learn what that, you will, you will ask for a particular tour, and then we'll be dividing you up accordingly. The other half will begin meeting. Uh, they'll meet for an hour and a half. Father General will spend a half hour with each group. And the other hour, you were asked to start discussing this. Is this the charter that you want? We're going to sign it. Should it change? Should it be modified? I doubt that people want to scrap it and start over. But is there, is there, what do you think about the charter? And then um, the plan. Start talking about the plan. On Thursday, but, oh, by the way, that's so there's a morning session. Either you're on a tour or you're in your discussion group in your, by region. We have lunch, and then in the afternoon, those that were on the tour are having their discussion. Those that were having a discussion go on, um, uh, have, have uh, uh, a tour. So You'll see that that's all, it will all be pretty clear, won't be very complicated, I think, uh, and that, that should run fairly smoothly. On Thursday, there are a series of groups that would like to make proposals that the new IAJU would collaborate, sponsor, um, endorse, whatever. Uh, this program, and there are four or five of those that will be presented on Thursday morning. Then you will break, and there will be a series of, you'll break into your regional group again. So the Latin Americans will meet, the Asians, South Asians will meet, the North Americans will meet, et cetera, et cetera, in their own group. And there, for an hour and a half, you will have the opportunity to answer a series of questions um, about these things, about, about the, um, the presentations, about the strategic plan, and elect your two representatives to the new IAJU board. Who should elect? One person from each institution should elect, should vote. Uh, there are a number, number of the, of the uh, regions have a number of other people that have come the people from the task forces that are here, but I think there should be only one vote for, per institution for the representative. Then, at the very last session, the plenary from three to five, each region will have 20 minutes to make its report on what it feels, what it recommends to the new IAJU board so that we get a chance to hear the different voices and the different concerns uh, by region. The regions are quite different. So I hope that's somewhat clear. It's going to unfold. It's, it's, it's going it's, it's to happen. It, it'll, it, I think it'll be fine. Uh, but if you have concerns about where you fit in something, just please let me know. So I want to start with the task forces. The first task force I'd like to present to you is um, the formation for leadership in, an Ignatian tradition, in the Ignatian tradition. Uh, it's been led by David McCallum from Lemoyne. And the, the um, task force report begins with this, these two sentences. The future of Jesuit education relies on the availability of people, Jesuits and lay colleagues in mission alike, who are fully capable of leading universities and colleges in a manner consistent with and devoted to the mission of the Society of Jesus. This availability depends on the ongoing intention to cultivate such mission-inspired leaders and to invest in formal opportunities. David would now like to present their report and He's ready to come to the mic. You know, in the interest of all staying awake, these may be filled with great information, but they also make great fans. 
And as a way of waking yourselves up, I invite you to turn to one of your neighbors and give yourself and each other some fan. Very nice, right? Also, we know that uh, the king and Father General have departed, so relax. This is the time to roll up our sleeves and start work. Uh, so if you'd like to be a little bit more relaxed in your attire, open your collar up, please feel free. Um, as I begin, I invite you to watch a video that was produced by our task force, specifically by Iteso University in Guadalajara. And as it portrays our colleagues in mission doing what they do and expressing why, it takes up some of the passion and energy that we saw con uh, basically taken up in that video this morning. Maybe not quite so polished and there's no bubbles involved, but I invite you to enjoy this and to find your own voice being included in some way by your colleagues. So for the video. Jesuit education is, should be, transformative education. The main mission of any Jesuit education is to help students developing their potential in such a way so that everyone becomes a person of compassion, competence, and science. One very important area in our colleges is taking care of what we call the Ignatian value, Kura Personalis, care for the individual. Care of that whole person so deeply that providing constructive feedback to help people grow becomes part of the vernacular, not just a pat on the back. I think, you know, growing this capability or this capacity for Ignatian leadership transcends not just to um, faculty and staff, but also transcends to students. It's a leader that does not impose, but proposes. It does not convince, but convinces. It's a leader that does not impose, but proposes. It does not convince, but proposes. Those whom you lead or with whom you work to live into sort of the fullness of their giftedness. El tipo de liderazgo que se requiere en general en las universidades me parece que es un liderazgo que busca en todo momento cuáles son las mejores condiciones para formar estudiantes que sean capaces de contemplar la realidad, de analizarla, de sentirla, para que con base en ello puedan ir apropiándose de acciones que los lleven a desarrollar. Eh, de vida para todos. Se necesita un, un tipo de liderazgo abierto a los demás que ponga al centro a las personas tanto como sujetos individuales pero sobre todo como sujetos colectivos, sujetos comunitarios. Um, communal discernment has become a huge part of how I lead at Creighton, engaging my colleagues to think more deeply about the difference we want to students like futuro de la formación de líderes ignacianos, leyendo en todo momento los signos de los tiempos. Para entender la situación de los jóvenes hoy, de ofrecerles experiencias que los contagien, en donde llegan en carne propia lo que es la injusticia, pero también la capacidad de la gente para luchar por sí misma. Por sus aspiraciones de, de vida, por la manera en que están construyendo Procesos de justicia, procesos de igualdad. C'est un leadership courageux euh, qui résiste à toutes sortes de pressions euh, qu'on rencontre dans les milieux universitaires. Ce que je veux dire par là, c'est que. Aquello que te da paz, que te da tranquilidad, que, que aumenta tu fe, tu esperanza y tu amor a los demás, es un señal de que eso es lo que Dios te está pidiendo, aunque te cueste trabajo, aunque sea difícil. ¿no? La capacité à créer une communauté éducative. On pourrait parler de communauté universitaire, de communauté de la société. Entonces, el tipo de liderazgo que creo que se necesita es uno que contagie, que sea capaz de, de sumar a los chavos, de convocarlos, de escucharlos, de, pero sobre todo de motivarlos a que tengan sus propias opciones y que sean capaces de luchar por ellas. Quant à l'aspect communautaire, social ou politique de l'éducation jésuite, son objectif est de former des hommes et des femmes capables, c'est-à-dire capables de transformer les différentes structures des sociétés humaines dans lesquelles ils travaillent. De travailler l'union des cœurs à consolider, 
à harmoniser, à travailler pour pacifier ces cœurs-là. I think the formation of faculty into Ignatian leaders is a difficult task. I think we need to become more and more creative and innovative. Estas líneas sobre las cuales se van definiendo los nuevos modos de, de hacer la educación sean modos que nos lleven a disminuir las desigualdades, a cuidar la casa común como el espacio en el que todos habitamos para que en todo momento vayamos formando estudiantes capaces de transformar la realidad de la que van siendo parte. As higher education changes so dramatically, we have more need for partnerships, working together with other institutions. We're not self-contained anymore. And I think that focus on the other puts Jesuit education and Jesuit educators in a strong position to lead and partner. And to me, that's the power of being Jesuit educated and having colleagues who are a part of this extraordinary mission that's so much bigger than anyone. How many of you found your own passion and purpose for being in higher education expressed in this video? I'm so glad. We meant it to be a real reflection of our collective voices. Um, by the way, I have no idea how my picture got in there, but we were very intentional to include my boss, Dr. Linda Lemura. We know we have to take care of our presidents and rectors, right? So. Um, you know, as we consider this question of how do we form leaders in an Ignatian way of proceeding, we know that it's one thing to form leaders who have tremendous competence to do the things that higher education is about. But it is a distinct set of characteristics that also adds to the way that we serve our mission in Jesuit higher education. And so for that purpose, I think we have to expand our notion of what leadership is about. So as we move forward, this is the mandate for our group, as Mike Garanzini had shared with us. And we heard in extensive words from Cardinal Rivasi about the kind of context that we're facing these days. Um, we also tried to map the tremendous range of things that are being done already in our institutions around the world when we had a good sense of all the good practices that are already currently underway, we began to discern a bit what are the kind of emerging challenges that will require changes. For instance, it's one thing to form leaders in lay positions for the first generation, but what happens for the second and the third in our institutions? How do we keep this mission of Jesuit higher education living from within and not just something incidental or tacked on from the outside? We looked to our recent general congregations for inspiration. And you'll see on just a few slides some of the quotes that inspired us. So notice this commitment that the Society of Jesus makes to the formation of our colleagues, but also to our own members. And the mutual partnership of that formation is actually what, what deepens and I think extends the value of the kind of um, programs we have. For instance, in the United States, the Ignatian Colleagues Program, where Jesuits and lay both expand, expand their own experience, share their own gifts, and bring to life what Ignatius said in the Contemplatio about love being a mutual communication of gifts. As we consider the content, of course, these programs should extend to all the various skill areas, but also dig into, in a very deep way, the history uh, and the spirit of our mission. And finally, 
you know, it's very hard to define in any way what Ignatian leadership is. So we're in a kind of ongoing and evolving project to describe in that conversation what is leadership in a specifically Ignatian way. And the words that keep coming forth in our documents and from, from Pope Francis is really this word discernment. How do we do discernment individually as leaders? How do we do it in common? And how do we help make very hard decisions about our institutions, cultivating the kind of interior freedom we must have to be able to make good choices in the Lord and inspired by the Spirit? These are the key questions that we'll be considering in our groups over the next few days. And we invite you to bring your own know-how and your own questions to these conversations. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, we want to then ex extend thanks to our task force members coming from all over the world. Thank you, Task Force One. Thank you, David. Our next um, task force uh, dealt with civic and political leadership formation. Uh, several years ago, two or three years ago now, um, a friend of uh, Father Adolfo Nicolas, a boyhood friend of Father Adolfo Nicolas that actually was in the Jesuit seminary for a while, uh, I think Pashi Echeria is here. Where is Pashi? Where is he? He's here. Here he is. <laughs> Welcome. He came to Father uh, Adolfo Nicolas, who pulled me in his office and said, listen to this man. And Pashi uh, was very articulate in saying basically this. You Jesuits have created civic leaders in every society that you have had a school. What are you doing today? Because we have such bad leaders all over the world. <laughs> so he, he made the case, he said, this should be one of the goals, one of the aims of, of Jesuit higher education. And the more we look at it, he was, this was three years ago. Uh, the concern he had then is only more serious today as we see the kind of political leaders that we, uh, we do have around the world, and it's become uh, something of a crisis, hasn't it? Uh, so what does the coming generation of global civic and political leadership look like? What do we do to help form men and women who are going to assume leadership positions uh, with a conscience that is based on such values as working for the common good, uh, working for social justice and equality, uh, working for the integrity of the environment. Um, those are the issues that were taken up by this task force. David Cullum was one of the chairs of this task force, and he will now tell us about uh, their work and invite you to their sessions. Thanks very much. Uh, um, I am trembling <laughs> because uh, my chancellor is here, my vice chancellor is here, my pro vice chancellor academic, my rector is here. <laughs> but I stand here as uh, an example of somebody who has been formed by the Jesuit. I am a lay person, I've worked with the Jesuits for a number of years to the extent that uh, I feel quite confident that Jesuit education is capable of forming civic and political leaders. And therefore what I present he here is something that I really believe in. Um, the task force that I worked with is also an inspiration. Um, you can see the members of the task force coming from all over the world, and we worked very well together, which is also for me an experience of how formation can happen when people 
work together. Now, we discussed a lot of things, but we wanted to identify what the issue is. In other words, how can a university, a Jesuit university, respond to the current um, challenges, demands uh, of the world? I'm glad that the cardinal in the morning identified uh, some of the, these challenges we were talking about. And it is important to recognize that these challenges are more than um, challenges for individual countries, individual communities. They are growing more and more connected uh, and, and, and people are growing more and more divided. And it is important to reorganize our responses to these challenges. And so how, and this is one of the issues, how can a Jesuit university respond to these uh, challenges that we are facing uh, today? Um, the Jesuit higher education institutions are benefiting from more than 450 old global um, traditions in education for the common good. So we do have resources that are spiritual resources, ethical resources, institutional resources. How can they be put together to respond to current challenges? This is what we hope that in our conversations we will put on, uh, on, um, on the table some of the things that we are suggesting, but we are hoping that members of those conversations can also bring more onto the table. We heard in the morning the challenge of formating new generations of people, civic and political leaders, facing the challenges that uh, humanity is facing. Um, there are quite a number of them, from uh, economic, environmental, gender inequalities, and so on. These challenges are increasingly having transnational dimensions. How can we collaborate to respond in our formation of civic and political leaders uh, to these transnational dimensions. Of course, philosophy, theology, and the practices that uh, Jesuit institutions have been developing over the years will be relevant, but they will need also to be put into their context. In other words, to be put in their context so that they can respond to the, um, the goals that we want uh, in, the, in our civic leaders and political leaders. One of the challenges is that living in the kind of society in which we are, people just follow without critical thinking. The economic and political forces are so powerful that a lot of our children, a lot of our citizens, don't have time and opportunities to think. How can we as Jesuit institutions in higher learning create conditions for critical thinking? This is one of the issues. So in thinking about this, our task force began to reflect on there are many people, many institutions, many traditions trying to respond to these challenges we are talking about. What could be the distinctive Jesuit approach? Of course, it's an approach we have seen which is based on Catholic social teaching, based on the traditions that we talked about uh, and so on, but the special issue that was mentioned in the morning, particularly the response 
to the Cardinal's uh, presentation was about the preferential option for the poor. That should be very clearly put across uh, as an important issue. So we said that um, in responding to that, um, situation in which our uh, politics are becoming more degraded, there's less conviction in terms of what politics can do, how can, as institutions of higher learning, uh, we redefine, reconceptualize, and rejuvenate the importance of politics? And we have put on the table the four dimensions of what we think could be a distinctive Jesuit approach. It is about, and we hope in the uh, conversations we will uh, put flesh to these approaches, and we hope that we will probably have more than these four approaches. But what is on the table is about uh, preparing future leaders and citizens, encouraging faculty to address real social uh, impact of our research, and engaging and dialoguing with our current civic leaders while we develop this university as uh, a place where we really experiment with the things that challenge us today. I thank you. Our third group is, uh, was dedicated to uh, interreligious dialogue. They wrote, our Jesuit universities inhabit a globally linked world made up of vastly different religious contexts. In some contexts, some locations, religious plurality, where Christians may be in a minority or a majority, or where Christianity is just one of many forms of social identity, has been the, a normal part of, our daily, of their daily living for centuries. That very plurality may be uh, lived harmoniously or may be a source of social division, tension, and conflict. Many Jesuit universities and institutions of higher education are located in societies more recently affected by changes in religious makeup due to the movement of populations or political shifts or changes in commonly held beliefs or in practice. Some environments are affected by violence fueled by religious tensions or the rise of religious fundamentalism. Others find themselves in the middle of growing religious indifference. David Llewellyn, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dorian Llewellyn is peer from the University of Santa Clara. He led the task force on religious uh, interfaith dialogue, and um, I invite him to the podium, Dorian, to tell us about the task force and um, the conversations. Thank you. Um, our Jesuit universities re uh, range tremendously in our resources, in our size, and our focus, but we, and we all inhabit a world which is composed of different social, geographical, and political contexts. Um, in all of our contexts, uh, religion plays out wherever we are, uh, in ways which are subtle or sometimes dramatic, and even in countries which are effectively now post-Christian, the influence of religion perdures. It's a form of culture, it's a mindset, and it manifests values, sometimes even in the most, in the most rigid secularism, you will find religion there. It is deeply enmeshed with local and global political and economic and environmental concerns. So this caused the Jesuit University to pay attention to a religious difference, to evaluate its, its positive impacts and its potential, as well as its challenges and possible threats. From that attention that we pay to this religious diversity, we hope to discern God's call. 
We live in societies which are not only local, but they're also globally linked. And increased global awareness can foster more integral action for the sake of the common good in our common home. So consequently, we need to educate our students better to be not only local, but also cosmopolitan citizens. And an important part of that education and awareness concerns the complexities of religion and religious plurality. So the Jesuit University has the duty of paying attention to students' religious literacy and interreligious competence in order for them to be able to better understand the world that is and to take more effective shared action in the world to come. So then, practically, how might we live, dialogue, and act as Jesuit universities in a world of religious difference? That is, as Jesuit universities and as Jesuit universities. So let me lay, name just five uh, five contemporary simultaneous realities that will shape our considerations. One, we heard from Car Cardinal Ravazzi this morning about communications technology. Our communications technology, the iPhones that many of us, I note, are using at the moment, uh, favors rapid communication and information, but it can lead to shallow interpersonal relations. It promotes certain kinds of diversity, while it also leads to uniformity. And as we have seen in many places, it corrals people into ideological ghettos. We live in a world of increasing religious polarization, which has two extremes. One, aggressive secularism, and at the other pole, religious fundamentalism. In many countries, uh, a greater openness to religious pluralism is being promoted as a social value. But it can also produce a unity which is superficial and relativistic. In many, many places, perhaps the majority, we are seeing large-scale historical shifts in religious affiliation. In North America and Western Europe, commitment to organized religion is distinctly on the decline. In other places, too, cultural Catholicism is yielding to materialistic secularism, to religious indifference, to a generic spirituality, or to Pentecostalism or evangelical Protestantism. Now, as a result of all these changes, in many places, the church and Christian institutions, such as the Jesuit University, are diminishing in their potential influence as a cohesive social force. So given the factors such as these, the encounter with people who are religiously different from ourselves and from our students is likely to grow in intensity and frequency. This change calls us to be more attentive, to analyze more intelligently, and to respond more thoughtfully. General Congregation 34 committed the society to the dialogue of life, the dialogue of action, the dialogue of religious experience, and the dialogue of theological exchange in the interreligious field. That was written 23 years ago, which is more than the age of most of our students. And in the generation which has passed since then, the global religious landscape has changed dramatically. Within the world of interreligious relations, the intention of dialogue has shifted away from explaining one's own faith. The concept move has moved now beyond personal or mutual enrichment to really a mutual transformation. We have become increasingly aware that we need to involve those people whose experience and worldview have generally not been included in the so-called great religions. And the experience that we talk about in the dialogic experience is now being understood to include not only the specifically spiritual experience, but also the experience of the marginalized and the powerless. So as we reflect on the evolving work of dialogue with religious difference, important ethical questions arise. For example, let me move forward. How can we avoid 
imposing one version of what it means to be in dialogue or one kind of community, one kind of unity that corresponds only to our ideas. What is the point of dialogue over religion in a context which is secularized? How can we engage in dialogue with religious partners who are convinced of the truth of their own position and of the, of the era of our position? And what is our role as Jesuit universities in pro proclaiming the gospel of Christ in an interreligious context or a post-religious one? I talked about opportunity as well as challenge. Our Jesuit educational heritage can offer this emerging reality rich practices of, way of, of arriving at shared understanding, communication, and action. All of us, for whoever, where, whoever we are, wherever we come from, share deep Jesuit DNA. Jesuit education has an inbuilt ethical imperative, and that suggests that we need not only to work toward shared action, but actually from shared action. Experts in the field are increasingly tell us that vital questions involving religious difference cannot be answered unless the parties actually do something together first. Pope Francis has told us that interreligious uh, encounter should not remain within an internal dialogue that seeks to sh establish shared values. Rather, it should move out into generally sh gen genuinely shared action for everybody's benefit. Action is the bridge to non-believers. Now this is going to demand a change in focus and in method and in partners. At the local level, especially where the situations are tense, establishing a healthy dialogue of life that takes into account emotional realities is going to be more compelling than a pure dialogue of intellect. So this approach argues then that working together has to be done first and that the university has a role in practical dialogue. Now I'd like to argue that university action includes the specific functions that only a university can perform. That is, academic excellence in research and teaching and raising critical awareness for the service of society. That is, the dialogue of experts. But our universities can be places of radical universal universality of attitude. They can be places of mutual enrichment as together we search the deepest questions about human existence and meaning. We have wide religious and cultural diversities and, and disparities, but we live in a global context which necessitates interreligious action informed first by the gospel, but by human rights, authentically human relations, and our relationship with nature. In this world of religious difference, the comprehensive humanism of Jesuit education champions integral human development. That is the what. The how will vary from place to place. The who is us. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Our uh, fourth group uh, was led by uh, Dr. Nancy Tuckman of Loyola University in Chicago. Um, this group writes on the issue of environment and economic justice. The church under Pope Francis has taken a leadership role in promoting economic and environmental justice. Laudato Si, has captured the respect of the world's leaders and the enthusiastic support of those interested in addressing our growing economic inequality within and between nations. She'll be, that'll be the theme of her talk with you and the theme of the workshops or discussion sessions under group four. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon. Three down, three to go. We're halfway there. 
Um, I would like to acknowledge Father Pedro Walpole, who is co-chairing this session, and also the five phenomenal people that are on this task force that have worked hard to put the, help, help us put this together. So the point that I wanted to start with here is the unidirectional economic system that we call capitalism, that we typically utilize in first world countries and is trying to be adopted and is being adopted in uh, developing countries as well. And you can see what, what's meant by unidirectional is that you have to extract resources from nature to make a product, to sell it, it gets used, and the, the benefit of growing GDP always improves if you can make things that only get used once and get used very lightly and then get thrown into the landfill or into the ocean or into our atmosphere, and then we have to extract more to make it again. So the faster we can push this, the faster our gross domestic product rises, and that's how we measure um, the quality of our countries, the strength of our countries. So this um, particular system is unsustainable in, it's, it's an infinite growth model that's very unsustainable in a planet that has finite resources. So we can't just keep pushing it in this one direction because we see that natural resources are depleted while the toxins and trash pile up. So this is kind of obvious to everybody, but it, it shows you the direct connection between our economy and our environmental issues. So the, the mainstream capitalism as we define it and as we teach it in um, most of our um, schools, uh, universities in our, um, both in economics and in our business schools is really about you know, this unidirectional model and this is the model that can drive GDP and bring wealth to, to different communities in different countries. So this model is, is pretty inappropriate for a planet that has finite resources. And um, to just make a quote on this, that today we are stealing the future, selling it in the present, and we're calling it gross domestic product. So there's really very little thought about the outcome of this. I want to play this film, and I'll let the people in the back do it. Naomi Klein um, has written a book called This Changes Everything, and she, she's also got a film under the same name. And we're going to show you here the trailer of the film. It's very fast, it's very loud and very dramatic. But I really like how she ties together the economic driver of climate change and then how this disproportionately affects the poor and the marginalized and how people are rising up and it's a call to action. So if you'd please play this, it's a quick two minute um, trailer here. The majority of the human race does not see global warming as a serious threat. Celebrate! <laughs> Climate legislation is dead. We in the global north, with less than 20% of the population, are responsible for over 70% of global emissions. We are drilling all over the place. Most affected by environmental injustice. How That old paradigm will be forced to change, either by the environment around us or by us. We are all part of this movement! When you see communities who are thrown into the front line, you see the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they stand up. So here's the big question. What if global warming 
isn't only a crisis. What if it's the best chance we're ever going to get to build a better world? Change or be changed? There are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we can reinvent our different future. Okay, that's pretty dramatic again, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's definitely a film worth seeing. It's a film worth um, showing in your classrooms as well. So one of the big questions is, are Jesuit universities complicit in this? Are we complicit in, in driving this capitalist um, economy and therefore training students to go out and make a lot of money and be really successful in their companies without thinking of the cost to people, to the planet, the way that, that people get uh, displaced when we go into a new area, indigenous people oftentimes being displaced from mining. Okay, so these are, these are all important questions that I think we need to be thinking about in our Jesuit universities. We're really you know, poised to be able to teach students a different way, more of a circular econo economy model. I pulled a couple of quotes from Thomas Berry's The Great Work, and this, this book is uh, several decades old now, but he was right on target when he talked about the role of universities, and I would say in particular the role of Jesuit universities. When he's saying, of the institutions that should be guiding us into a viable future, the university has a special place because it teaches all of the professions. Recently, universities have supported an exploitation of the earth by their teaching in business, the sciences, engineering, law, and economics. Our educational institutions need to see their purpose not as training personnel for exploiting the earth, but as guiding students towards an intimate relationship with the earth. And this sounds like it was taken right out of Laudato Si. <laughs> for this, for this is, uh, sorry, for it is the planet itself that brings us into being. It sustains us in life and delights us with its wonders. And he sort of goes on, um, but one thing I want to point out is that the millennials that we teach now seem to understand that everything is connected, and this is really what the Pope says over and over again in Laudato Si about an integral ecology. Everything is connected. Every action and decision and purpose that we make has a ripple effect, both upstream in the supply chain and downstream in the waste stream. Students understand that, and they want to know, how can I be part of the solution? Laudato Si is so valuable in this conversation because it really speaks to everybody. It doesn't speak just to scientists or engineers or humanists. It speaks to all people on the planet, and it really teaches us how closely related and how completely dependent we are on natural systems, and keeping them clean and healthy benefits humans and human health and well-being as well. So we, our task force would argue that the Society of Jesus must employ moral and religious leadership to intervene and effect a, cha effect a change in direction through its expansive social and ecological ed educational directorates. So in our discussions, we will bring a few different models of how this can be done in Jesuit universities, how we can rethink our economic model and the way towards a sustainable future. And the zero waste economy is, is something actually that the EU is taking up now, which is very exciting. So this is where I'm going to stop, but um, we hope that you'll take an interest in, in really thinking about these things, thinking about solutions and ways forward with our students. Thank you. Group number five uh, was dedicated to the topic of educating the marginalized. Looking at the world today, they wrote, we see how abject poverty, injustice, discrimination, and suppression result in systemic violence against the dignity of men, women, and children. The end result from the world of conflict and suppression, persecution, violence, natural disaster, the scourge of poverty is refugees migrants and internally displaced people. 
economically, socially, and religiously marginalized. This end result needs a response as a testament to the innate desire for happiness and dignity of every human being. The key to reform the society is empowering education that gives hope even in the midst of hopeless situations and courage to break through, to break through the dominating and oppressing fetters of suppression and discrimination. Father Francis Xavier is the academic uh, vice director, vice president of Jesuit Worldwide Learning, and he led the task force on education for the marginalized. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Good afternoon. Thanks to the organizing committee and gratitude to the members of the task force. The task force on the education of the marginalized believes the transformation of the world is possible through the education of the marginalized where we learn together with them. So if you look at the present scenario regarding the forcibly displaced population, it has doubled within 20 years from 33.9 million to 68.5 million. By end of 2017, the refugees are 25.4 million, internally displaced 40 million, asylum seekers 3.1 million. So if you look at the scenario, every minute of the day, 31 people are newly displaced. So what is our social responsibility? And there are more. The other marginalized people due to social, religious, and political discriminations. So we can ask ourselves, what have we done to empower and integrate them? What are we doing to reduce the redress, injustice, and discrimination? And what could we do to bring in peace and harmony? And you, this slide shows where this education of the people at the margins are most needed, depending on the GDP, mostly in Africa, Asia, and uh, Caribbeans. We need that. These are the Rohingyas that we have people at the margins around us. But if we create an atmosphere and give them an opportunity, they can do very well. This is the study center in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya where they are taking up the online course offered by the Jesuit Worldwide Learning. And this is in Bamiyan where the female students are very much interested and the parents are very, much encouraging them, and they are also learning the course. Here, the Sri Lankan internally displaced, still they are not all right. They need the education, in fact, higher education. And in India, that the Dalit girls, they are empowered by the Jesuit education. So what is our empowering strategy? Since we are from the higher education, we need to think ways and means of do that. Of course, the input is Ignatian pedagogy. And the means is we need the online teaching and mentoring accompanying the students, and that needs global networking. This is the ideal chance where we can think of that and act on that. The expected output is the critical thinking by the people, and we should also realize we receive their values in giving them the education. And the learning together is also intercultural and interreligious formation. In the JWL education, the students from Afghanistan, they are able to work with students in the refugee camps in Africa for their uh, assignments, and they come to know not only about the individuals, but the culture and religion. Ultimately, we expect leadership and entrepreneurship <clears throat> so that they have the <clears throat> social commitment for social transformation. So the need of the hour, globally, 
looking at it, we need blended model, online teacher and on-site tutor. Also, we have to design curriculum from the perspective of the people at the margin, and we need collaboration with mission-aligned institutions and agency, and as Pope Francis indicated, we need to look into research mainly to find out the origins of conflicts, poverty, and also viable solution. And we could also think of locally, in our own vicinity of our institutions, we have these people. What do we do for their empowerment? Could we welcome them into our campuses? Where could our faculty and students could spend time in adopting them and their areas and working for their welfare? There are a few models I have indicated here, of course, most of us are doing. In Congo, Loyola University, science is taken to the rural areas. In Narupe University, Zimbabwe, there is fusion of margins into university. In Haveriana, Colombia, the students are involved in social transformation projects. And in Arupe College, Chicago, the associate degree program is mainly organized and offered for the most well, uh, the, uh, these vulnerable students there. In India, like Loyola College, the outreach program where the departments adapt particular place in the vicinity or in the nearby places, mostly slums and other places, and they take care of the people's need. And Jesuit Worldwide Learning is offering higher education online, English learning, professional courses, and also diploma, 45 degree, uh, 45 um, uh, credit diploma offered through the Regis University. And more information is given in the annual report of the JWL as you go out you will be getting a copy of that you will get. There are other organizations preparing people at the margins, for example, JRS and Fialegri and others, we need to collaborate with us. But the impact is really great. As I mentioned earlier, the Loyola University Congo promotes oyster mushroom projects, about 60 kilometers away, the professors visit the people and help them. And Columbia Haveriana, the education is with the people at the margins. And at the end, you see the graduation. This is taken in Kakuma, the Chaleka refugee camp in Malawi. Next week, there is going to be graduation of another batch in both in Kenya and Malawi in their uh, uh, refugee camps. And these are the people who are the alumna, alumnus and alumna of uh, JWL courses, Roland and Grace. They were invited by the UNESCO conference in Paris a couple of years ago. And in Bamiyan, the women are taking up the lead, whether forming the bike club or ski club or studying together, they are doing that. And Pope has indicated that we have to work on research and JWL follows this research model. This is the bottom-up transformation where using the global thinking and the community of leaders online and on-site, how do we work? And how using our Ignatian experience, we can give the high quality uh, education to the people. Of course, their physical uh, need also is there. And we need global partnership. We also have the transformation through education for a more peaceful, humane world. Recently, the Pope said, change your education system, the society would be changed. So this is the work of the Society of Jesus, and we have a responsibility for these people. And we have to have this program where we work together to transform the world. So keeping this program of JWL and collaborating with JWLR with one another, we can really realize our goal in that. So here, as Pope said, studies into the root causes of forced migration with the aim of identifying variable, viable solutions is the need of the hour and the action plan. We are aware of it. Academic, we need to collaborate and innovate program for the needs of the marginalized, and research, social and scientific research, as mentioned earlier, and how does this research help the people for the target group? And we need finance as well. The Jesuit universities and colleges could 
think of endowments or scholarships, or they can seek donors and benefactors, and the faculties could contribute the part of their time or stipend for the welfare of the students, education of the students, and the faculty and students could be offered the immersion program. They could visit the places where these marginalized are there, even if you can't go to the refugee camps, in the vicinity you have the marginalized and you can do, and thereby you come to know their need and you can work. There is also advocacy. We are powerful people, and higher education needs to integrate these people into the mainstream society, and also we need to address the circumstance of women and children. And as in the language of John Subruino, we can say the marginalized are the crucified today. As Father Karanjini quoted that in the beginning, the end result from the world of conflict and suppression, persecution, violence, natural disaster, and the scourge of poverty is refugees, migrants, internally displaced, economically, socially, and religiously marginalized. What is our answer to them? The answer is creating opportunity for a better world. And Jesuit higher education is an empowering education and our challenge, and also it is our privilege. So once again, every now and then, we can ask ourselves the Ignatian soul-searching questions. What have we done? What we are doing? What ought we to do for the people at the margins through higher education? We know, we know our heritage, we know our mission, only we have to act upon. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Father Francis. And our very last, but not least, task force was led by Elias Palma Lopez from Comillas and um, University in Spain. And uh, I won't read anything because we're running out of time, so I'll get you right to the platform. Peace and reconciliation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm in white because I'm going to talk about peace, okay? Peace and reconciliation. Voy a cambiar español, ¿vale? El reino de los cielos es un reino de paz y un reino de justicia. Y para entrar en el reino de los cielos hay que convertirse como niños. No necesariamente por el ser naif, ¿eh? sino que tenemos que ser tremendamente mansos como palomas, pero tremendamente astutos como serpientes. Y por eso estamos aquí, para intentar ser astutos como serpientes y poner todas nuestras instituciones al servicio de esta gran misión que nos plantea la Compañía de Jesús y que, si os dais cuenta, todo el resto de las task forces de los grupos de trabajo han tocado el tema de conflicto, el tema de paz, el tema de reconciliación. Okay, if I can speak in English better, let's try. Okay. So, all this is coming from God. The Ministry of Reconciliation is coming from God. It is a gift from the heaven. It is a gift from the source of love, that is God. It is a grace, but we need to cooperate with that grace, with that gift. And we are invited to become ambassadors of reconciliation, ambassadors of peace. And for that, we need to get organized. If, uh, Saint Ignatius was the first one in, in the formula of the Institute who wrote by hand, the Society of Jesus was founded for reconciling uh, this 
reconciliar desavenidos, people put apart. The General Congregation 35th is the one that takes the topic again very clearly and sends us to reconcile in these three levels, three dimensions. Reconciliation with God, reconciliation with humanity, and reconciliation with creation that we have touched here. The general congregation 36 is even clearer than the previous one, saying that all the works of the Society of Jesus has, have to be committed to the mission of reconciliation, also the intellectual apostolate. That is why, because we have a reality of violence all over the world, 90,000 deaths by more than 100 armed conflicts. And we, when we look at not only armed conflicts, but we look at organized violence, these are the figures. 600,000 deaths last year, a year. What can we do as International Association of Jesuit Universities to reduce one violent death per minute in the world. But if we look at you know, structural violence and bad governance, we will see that this figure uh, multiplies by 50, even 100. What can we do? Let's see now a video in which we have uh, Pacho de Rue in Colombia. Right now, we could say that Colombia is one of the international focus for issues related to reconciliation. And we have the, the wonderful example of, of Colombia. And Pacho de Rue was the previous provincial there. Uh, but now he's the president of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Colombia. And we have asked him what our tertiary education institutions can do at the service of reconciliation. We have first him answering this question, and later we will have uh, Luis Fernando Munera, the dean of the Faculty of Political Sciences in Bogota, in the Javeriana of Bogota, answering with a concrete example. They have developed a tool to commit enterprises in the mission of reconciliation. Let's have a look. Tomando un poco las palabras que aquí el Papa le decía a los obispos, coloquen sus manos en la carne ensangrentada de su pueblo. En ese contexto nosotros estamos haciendo la comisión para el esclarecimiento de la verdad y pienso que aquí hay un conjunto de elementos que pueden ser de inspiración para nuestras universidades, porque es el resultado de haber discutido y a y recogido las experiencias de muchas comisiones de la verdad en el mundo. ¿De qué se trata? Se trata en primer lugar de avanzar al esclarecimiento de la verdad. Eso es como se llama esta comisión. Y esclarecer supone adentrarse en las causas estructurales que produjeron los conflictos en cualquier parte del mundo y las victimizaciones. Y en ese esclarecimiento tratar de llegar a las responsabilidades institucionales Dentro del gran propósito institucional de la Universidad Javeriana de trabajar por la construcción de paz y la reconciliación, hace un par de años un grupo de profesores de diversas facultades, dirigidos por la Vicerrectoría de Extensión y Relaciones Interinstitucionales, llegaron a un acuerdo con la Fundación Paz País y con el Instituto Colombiano de Normas Técnicas de Calidad y Contec para desarrollar una norma técnica de empresa que hemos llamado Sistema de Gestión de Cultura de Paz Organizacional. Esta norma técnica de empresa busca generar acciones específicas de cultura de paz al interior del mundo empresarial, básicamente en cuatro aspectos identificados. Humanización de la cultura de paz organizacional, 
y la humanización de los ambientes de trabajo, la promoción por el respeto a los derechos humanos, el apoyo a la implementación de los acuerdos de paz colombianos y estrategias de conciliación y respuesta ante situaciones de conflicto. Estas cuatro acciones específicas de, paz, de cultura de paz generan un sello de calidad apoyado por nuestro certificador de calidad nacional y la Universidad Javeriana ha construido también un sistema de apoyo, de formación y de consultoría para las empresas que quieran implementar esta norma técnica de empresa al interior de sus organizaciones. This is one of the examples, good examples that we have of the commitment of our universities in the mission of reconciliation, but we have many around the world in your universities. What are our challenges? We have chosen three in our task force. The first one is to listen to the context, to the violent context, to do contemplative analysis of reality, and to have a direct exposure to suffering people at times, because our private universities, we are uh, far apart from the real wound of the world, and we need to get in touch because, because we cannot heal from outside. First challenge. Second one. I'm working also with GRS in Latin America. When we were bringing the mission of reconciliation to divided communities, our workers felt that there was a real problem, that we were bringing reconciliation and peace to them. Meanwhile, in our organizations, there were conflicts and there were divisions internally. We cannot bring the mission of reconciliation outside if we cannot work first in the mission of reconciliation inside. And that is why we need to be reconciled institutions internally, at personal level and also at the institutional level. How to do that? We need your help to see how to do that. Third, three actions. Mapping, collaboration, networking, and institutional examen. So now we need to be not only reconciled institutions, but also reconciling institutions outside. These three actions. First one, mapping. These questions are for you. What are the key needs of reconciliation in your own context? What is your institution doing to respond to these needs? At the level of research, the three missions of, the, of a university, research, teaching, and service to society. We want to focus in two things, in service to society. For instance, this University of Deusto is a university convening different actors eh, to a round table to transform conflicts. Our universities can be places, safe places to convene different actors in conflict. Convening. And the second one, advocacy for pontifical universities. This is our boss. He's doing advocacy there. So the whole thing of going to the centers of decision making and bring the proper analysis, the proper alternatives that demand a lot of research to bring a type of solution, the next possible step. Collaboration and networking. We were thinking that maybe it would be good also to bring all our instit institutes of peace, conflict transformation, as we have the business schools that have come in a network. Maybe we have several of these institutes around the world. Here we can start uh, the networking process. This could be a, a very good output for us, I think. And also for us was very important institutional examine. What are 
we doing in fact related to reconcile and reconciling institutions? Can we measure what we are doing? I think this is important also for us. Measurement of outcomes related with the mission of reconciliation. The general goal. I think we need to organize ourselves to get a corpus of thought, critical thinking, systematic thinking on the mission of reconciliation and peace based in the spiritual roots of the Society of Jesus. Our spiritual Christian background open to dialogue with other traditions. This is not done. In Comillas University, we are trying to get all the disciplines coming together in interdisciplinary dialogue to try to create this corpus. And we need all your expert expertise to develop this. We think that this concept of the General Congregation 36, it is important. The concept of reconciling communities of discernment. We believe that discernment in different contexts, when we go to different places in Africa, Latin America, Europe, Asia, we see that discernment in common or collaborative discernment can be a very good tool to transform conflicts. We have that in our DNA. So we need to think out of the box to make real our vision, to become institutions that promote peace and reconciliation, justice and faith through research and formation in order to transform society and culture. And I would like to thank to you for listening to, to this and for the cooperation in this topic that is an umbrella topic for the mission of the Society of Jesus and to the members of the committee, the task force, a big applause for them because they are behind all this thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elias. Thank you, Elias. Thank you to all of our uh, task force chairs here. As you can see, these are not unrelated to one another. Uh, but as you can see as well, these are very distinct areas where we should be, could be working. The goal of these conversations is to try and find out more about what you are doing in your own institution in these areas. The conversations are listed in the back of your program. I think perhaps you, hopefully you have seen them already. So after page 59, you start to see that each of these task forces is sponsoring three conversations in conversation A, which is now. They're sponsoring three different conversations in conversation B, which will be tomorrow morning, and another three different but related conversations in conversation C, which is tomorrow afternoon. So plenty of areas to talk about, plenty of things to share. And again, our goal is to try and surface what are you doing? We need to share models and examples, programs that are on the way or have been quite successful because this is these six topics are an interest to all of us. And uh, the more we know from one another, the richer we will be and the more successful we will be as an organization. So we break now for uh, about a 20 minute coffee break and then at four, let's say 4.15, 4.20, uh, you will have a chance to go to these conversations and I think Alvaro already told us how they will be, how you'll find out. Just to remember, uh, you, when you get out now, you will see that in the cloître you've got some desks with the capital letters for, uh, from A to C, so you can reach uh, your surname uh, and ask for the page where you're going to have your tax force and the room it is. But at quarter past four, 
you will also see somebody handing the number of the tax force. You can reach that volunteers and they will take you to the rooms that are, are all near. Okay? And remember to handle in the tools you have chosen for Loyola. And be sure to put your name on them. Uh, because there was, there was no space for the name. Uh, but if you mark the name, we can organize the tours. So, so just a minute, please. 4.15, 4 we will go to the groups. We will finish by quarter to six. At six, we will have the mass at the same place that we had it to, yesterday, in the Gothic chapel. And we will see all of us tomorrow at nine here. Yeah? Pretty good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we're on our way. That was well, well done. I think it went yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah.